This is a reading from The Little Flowers of St. Francis. Eighteen, on persevering in good. What good does it do a man to fast, pray, give alms, mortify himself, and receive great graces from heaven, and not reach the haven of salvation? Sometimes a ship appears on the sea that is beautiful, large, new, and full of rich treasure, but some disaster happens to it and it does not reach port safely, but sinks miserably. What good did all its excellence and beauty do it? Again, sometimes there is a ship on the sea that is small, ugly, old, contemptible, and not full of treasure, and with great difficulty it escapes the dangers of the sea and safely reaches port. That alone is worthy of praise. This happens also with men in this world, so it is right that we should all fear. Although a tree has grown, yet it is not large all at once. And if large, it is not in bloom. And if in bloom, nevertheless, it does not immediately bear fruit. And if it bears fruits, they are not large at first. And if they are large, yet they are not ripe. And if ripe, nevertheless, all of them do not reach the mouths of those who eat them. But many fall down and rot away, or are eaten by pigs or other animals. Someone said to him, May the Lord make you end well. Brother Giles answered, What good would it do me? if I went begging for the kingdom of heaven for a hundred years, if I did not end well. I think the two great good things for men are to love God and always to keep oneself from sin. He who had those two good things would have all that is good. On the religious life and its security. Brother Giles used to say about himself, I would rather have a little of God's grace in the religious life than a great deal in the world because there are more dangers and fewer aids in the world than in a religious order. But a sinful man has more fear of what is good for him than of what is bad for him, because he is more afraid of doing penance and joining a religious order than he is of staying in sin or remaining in the world. A layman asked Brother Giles advice as to whether or not he should become a religious. The Holy Brother Giles answered, If a very poor man knew what a valuable treasure was hidden in some public field, would he ask anyone's advice whether he should go after the treasure in a hurry? How much more should men hurry to dig up the heavenly treasure? When he heard this, that man joined a religious order after selling all his property. Brother Giles also used to say, many enter the religious life and do not practice those things that are a basic part of the religious life. And they are like a farmer who would put on the armor of of Roland but not be capable of using it in battle. For not all men are able to ride the horse Bayard, or if they rode it, could keep from falling off. I don't think it is much to enter the court of a king, nor do I think it much to receive gifts from a king, but I do think it is a great thing to know how to remain in a royal court by doing the right thing. The court of the great king is the religious life. To enter it and to receive some gifts from God in it is not much but to be able to live in it by doing the right thing and to persevere devoutly and conscientiously in it to the end is a great thing. For I would rather live as a layman and yearn devoutly and anxiously for the religious life than to be a religious and be tired of it. The glorious Virgin Mary, Mother of God, came from ancestors who were sinners, and she was never in any religious order, yet she is what she is. A religious should believe that he neither can nor knows how to live except as a religious. Once he also said to his companion, From the beginning of the world until now, there has never appeared a religious order that is better or more advantageous than the order of Friars Minor. He also said, It seems to me that the order of Friars Minor was truly sent into this world for the great benefit of men. But woe to us! unless we are such men as we should be. The order of Friars Minor seems to me to be the poorest and the richest in the world, but this seems to me to be our greatest vice, that we wish to walk too high. He is rich who imitates the rich man. He is wise who imitates the wise man. He is good who imitates the good man. He is handsome who imitates the handsome man. And he is noble 
who imitates the noble man that is our Lord Jesus Christ. 20. On obedience and its usefulness. The more a religious is restricted under the yoke of obedience for the love of God, the more fruitful will he be. And the more a religious is obedient and subject to his superior for the honor of God, the poorer and purer from sin will he be before the other men of this world. A truly obedient religious is a well-armed knight riding on a good horse who passes safely among enemies, and no one can harm him. But a religious who grumbles at obeying is like an unarmed knight riding on a bad horse who, when passing among the enemy, falls and is immediately captured, chained, wounded, imprisoned, and sometimes put to death. A religious who wants to live according to his own will wants to go into the fire of hell. As long as the ox holds its head under the yoke, it fills the barns with grain. But the ox that does not hold its head under the yoke and wanders around may think it is a great lord, but the barns are not filled with grain. The great and the wise humbly put their heads under the yoke of obedience, but the foolish withdraw their heads from under the yoke, under the yoke and do not want to obey. Sometimes a mother nourishes and take good care of her son, and takes good care of her son, and after he has grown up, he does not obey his mother because of his pride, but makes fun of her and looks down on her. The mother is the religious order, and the son is the religious who, after it has nourished and taken good care of him, later looks down on it and makes fun of it, and does not want to be obedient. I think it is greater to obey a superior for the love of God than to obey the Creator Himself, giving some command in person. Now, it seems to me that if someone had so much grace that he spoke with angels, if he were called by someone whom he had promised to obey, he should interrupt his talk with the angels and obey the human being, because while he is under someone's orders in this world, he is bound to obey the man who is his superior for the sake of the Creator. And this is the proof, because the Lord, as we read in the first book of Kings, did not disclose his will to Samuel before he had Heli's permission. He who has put his head under the yoke of obedience, and later to follow the way of perfection, withdraws his head from under the yoke of obedience, that is a sign of great hidden pride. A good habit is the way to all good, and a bad habit is the way to all evil. 21. On Remembering Death If someone had lived from the beginning of the world until now, and had always suffered from evil as long as he lived, and were soon to go to all good, what harm would all the evil that he suffered do him? And if someone always had all good things from the beginning of the world until now, and he were now to go to all evil, what good would all the good that he had had do him? A layman said to him, I would like to live a long life in this world and have everything in abundance. He answered him, If you were to live a thousand years and be the Lord of the whole world, when you died, what reward would you get from the flesh that you served? But a man who does right and takes good care of his soul for a short while will receive an indescribable reward in the future. Part 6, Additional Chapters 1. How St. Francis abhorred the name Master Francis, the humble imitator of Christ, knowing that the name Master was only appropriate for Christ, by whom all things were made, used to say that he would gladly wish to do all things, but he did not want to be a master or be known by the name Master, lest by such a name he should seem to be acting against the saying of Christ, in the gospel that forbids anyone to be called master, because it was better for him to be humble with his poor little knowledge than, if, he were possi if it were possible, to perform great deeds and presume to go against the humble words of so glorious a master. For the name master is appropriate only for the blessed Christ, all of whose acts are perfect. And so he commanded that no one on earth should presume to be called master, because in heaven there is only one true master without any defect, the blessed Christ, who is God and man, light and life, the maker of the world, who is glorious and to be praised forever. Amen. 2. 
concerning the marvelous statue that spoke to St. Francis. One night, when St. Francis was devoutly praying to Almighty God in the place of St. Mary of the Angels, a very wonderful vision appeared before his bodily eyes, a great statue similar to the one which King Nebuchadnezzar saw in a dream. For, if it had a, for it had a head of gold and a very beautiful face, and its chest and arms were of silver, its abdomen and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And it was dressed in sackcloth, which seemed to make it blush with shame. Now St. Francis, gazing at the statue, was greatly amazed at its indescribable beauty and its wonderful size, and also at the shame that it seemed to feel about the sackcloth in which it was dressed. And while he was gazing with wonder at its extremely beautiful head and face, the statue itself spoke to him, saying, Why are you so amazed? God has sent you this example so that you may learn from me what is to happen to your order in the future. My golden head and very beautiful face that you see is the beginning of your order, based on the perfection of the gospel life. And just as the substance of gold is more valuable than all other metals, and as the position of the head and face is superior to that of the other members, so the beginning of your order will be of such great value because of the golden fraternal charity, and of such great beauty because of the angelic purity, and of such great loftiness because of its evangelical poverty, that the entire world will be astounded, and Queen Saba, that is, Holy Mother Church, will marvel and rejoice in heart when it sees the first chosen friars of your order, when it sees in the first chosen friars of your order such Christ-like beauty. such Christ-like beauty and splendor of spiritual wisdom shining as in angelic mirrors. And blessed will be those who conform themselves utterly to Christ and strive to imitate the virtues and customs of that first precious metal, the golden head, by adhering more to its heavenly beauty than to the deceptive flowers of the world. Now, the chest and arms of silver will be the second state of your order, which will be as inferior to the first as silver is to gold. And just as silver has great value and brightness and sonorousness, so in that second state there will be many friars who will be so brilliant in Holy Scripture and the light of holiness and the sublimity of the Word of God that some of them will be made popes and cardinals and many will be bishops. And because a man's strength is shown in his chest and arms, so in that time the Lord will raise up in your order men who will be outstandingly brilliant in both knowledge and virtue and who will defend this order, and also the entire church by knowledge and virtue from the many attacks of the devils and various attacks of faithless men. But although that future generation will be admirable, nevertheless it will not attain the very perfect state of the first friars, but compared to them it will be like silver compared to gold. After, after it there will be a third state in your order that will be like the bronze abdomen and thigh, because as bronze is considered of less value than silver, so those of the third state will be inferior to the first and second. And although they will spread in numbers and distance over a great part of the world, like bronze, nevertheless, there will be among them some whose God is their belly, and for whom the glory of the, of the order is in their shame, and who mind only earthly things. And although because of their knowledge they will have an amazing eloquence, like sounding brass, yet alas, because they will be lovers of their belly and their body, they will be in the eyes of God, as the Apostle says, like sounding brass, or a tinkling cymbal, because while uttering heavenly words and begetting spiritual offspring by showing to others the fountain of life, they themselves will be fatally arid, and will adhere without interior grace to the earth. May the mercy of God succor them. Amen. After them will come forth terrible and frightening state. After them will come a fourth terrible and frightening state, which is shown to you in the iron legs. For just as iron overcomes and dissolves bronze, silver, and gold, so that state will be of such iron-like hardness and depravity that the coldness and horrible blight and metallic morality of that dangerous time will sweep into oblivion 
whatever good the golden charity of the first friars and the silver truth of the second and the bronze, though resounding, eloquence of the third have erected in the Church of Christ. However, as the legs support the body, so those friars will support the body of the order by some hypocritical, rusty strength, and therefore both the iron belly and legs will be hidden by clothing, because those friars will have the habit of the order and piety, but within they will be ravenous wolves. But those rusty and iron-like friars, serving only their belly, although they may hide it from the world, yet it will be evident to the Lord, because by the hammer of their perverse life they will reduce to nothing their most precious gifts. Therefore, like the hardest iron, they will be afflicted with the fire of tribulations and the hammer of terrible trials, so that they will be melted down not only by the fires and burning coals of the devils, but also of secular authorities, in order that such powerful persons may suffer torments from powerful men, and because they sinned by irreverence and hardness, they will be cruelly tortured by irreverent men. As a result of those trials, they will be stirred to such impatience that, just as iron resists all metals, they will set themselves in opposition to everyone, and thus they will stubbornly oppose not only secular authorities, but also their spiritual superiors, thinking that they can resist everything, like iron and thereby they will greatly displease God. Now, the fifth state will be partly of iron, referring to the above-mentioned hypocrites, and partly of earth, referring to those who give themselves completely to worldly business. And as you see burnt clay and iron appearing together in the feet, although they can in no way unite, so will it be in the last state of this order. For a great abomination and division shall arise among the earthly, ambitious, hypocrites, who are hardened by the mire of temporal things and the desires of the flesh, for like clay and iron they cannot come together because of their great discord, and they will despise not only the gospel and the rule, but also with their clay and iron feet, that is, with their perverse and impure cravings, they will tread upon all the discipline of this holy order, and just as clay and iron are separate entities, so many of them will be divided among themselves, both interiorly by living in a state of contentiousness and exteriorly by adhering in a partisan way to secular despots. As a result, they will arouse the hostility of everyone to such a point that they will hardly be able to enter or reside in towns or openly wear the habit, and many of them will be punished and liquidated by frightful tortures at the hands of seculars who despise such abominable feet. All this will happen to them, because they have wholly turned away from the golden head. But in those perilous days, those who turn back to the warnings of that precious precious head shall be blessed, for the Lord will try them like, a gold, like gold in a furnace, and will crown them and welcome them into eternity like a victim of a holocaust. Now this habit that I seem to be ashamed of is holy poverty. Although it is the jewel and splendor of the whole order and the unique custodian and crown and basis of all holiness, nevertheless those degenerate sons, lacking all virtuous efforts, will, as we said, be ashamed of that most holy poverty, and putting aside their coarse habits, they will select and obtain, even by simony, expensive and ostentatious robes. But blessed and happy will be those who persevere to the end in what they have promised to the Lord. And after saying this, that statue vanished. St. Francis was greatly amazed at all this, and like the good shepherd, weeping tears, he commended his present and future sheep to Almighty God. May our Lord Jesus Christ be praised and glorified forever. Amen.